So I'm not planning on doing a big PowerPoint or anything. It's just a couple slides to make sure we're all on the same page with what APIs are, because I imagine we have quite a bit of um, difference in backgrounds. So just a real quick explanation of what's going on and what they do, and then we'll dive into REDCap, how it does um, AP, handles APIs, and look at a couple real quick examples in one Python and one in R, just to show how simple it is to set things like that up. Um, as Harry mentioned earlier, and in Vern, it's not limited just to languages like Python and R. Lots of different languages can use it, and also other applications like Excel and Power BI and so on. But I find that with programming, it really helps to understand a little bit of what's going on behind the scenes, especially if you run into problems. So first of all, what is an API? Um, it stands for Application Programming Interface. So what that really means is it's a way for two programs to talk back and forth to each other, sharing data in both directions. Um, so today we'll look at, like I said, primarily R and Python um, interacting with REDCap. Um, and as Terry did mention, we're hoping to do a follow-on to this that would go into a lot more depth. Um, ideally, I'd love to do a session where we kind of do a tutorial followed by an opportunity for people to try it hands-on and actually do a project on their own um, if there's enough interest in that. Um, so the web API, it's going to use the same networking that your web browser uses, which is either HTTP or HTTPS. Um, and you don't need to know a lot about that, but it helps to understand how it's working, um, if we at least understand what it's doing. And basically all that means is we're going to use the network to send requests, um, things like a GET, which says give me some information back, a POST, where we're going to say, hey, here's some information for the other application. A lot of those um, types of requests that we can send. But we don't really have to deal with those directly very much because um, if we're working in a programming language, we're usually going to use a package of some sort, which is just code someone else has written that handles all of that for us. So in R, we would be using um, either the HTTR or HTR, HTTR2 packages. Um, I use HTTR only because that's what REDCap defaults to. Um, it's a little bit of an older version, but it still works fine. And then in Python, we use requests, and I'll demonstrate that in just a minute. Um, one thing that's really helpful to know when you're working with APIs is when you send those requests, um, some sort of a response code always comes back. And there's only a few that you really need to, to troubleshoot things. But one of the, um, the code 200 is what you almost always want to see. That means everything's working fine. Um, and you can pretty much safely ignore those. But there's a couple that I run into periodically that um, it's good to know what they mean. So a 404 is a, usually a security failure, and that usually means you've done something wrong. Usually you're not passing the security information correctly. It's basically a login failure. Um, and we'll look at why that happens in a minute. And then also the other one is a 503, which means there, for whatever reason, your computer can't talk to the server. And it could mean that red caps down, not likely, but that would be a possibility. It could mean that you're not on our network. It could mean you, your internet connection's not working. Anything like that will give you a 503. And those are the three most common um, responses I get back. Of course, you always want the 200. Um, the way we make the call is similar to what you type into a browser. So you can see under the example here, it just looks like a regular web address because it is. Um, and it's just going to use those same protocols. And if we break this down, the first part, the HTTPS is the protocol we want to use. That just means it's encrypted. Um, the IP address we want to connect to. So I'm using the test server. So what you see today will always have this test on it. For a live project, you wouldn't have that. You'd have the Red Cap production server. Um, the Red Cap API, the endpoint is always called API. So that goes on the end here. And then there'll be parameters on top of that. And those parameters, which go on the end, are things like, am I asking for data? Am I sending data? What's my security credentials? And fortunately, REDCap builds all of that for you. So we'll take a look at that um, here in just a second. So that's the, 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 a very quick overview of an API and some of the details we need to work with this. Um, when we go into REDCap, um, you can pick your project, and I just created a very simple demonstration project for this. Um, if we go into the designer, you'll see all it is is the demographic form that is a, a template that's available on REDCap, and I put a few dummy, one dummy record in there for myself, um, so there's not a lot of data in there. 
But before we can actually interact with the API on this project, the first thing we need to go down is scroll down here where we have API and API Playground. The API, before you can use it, we have to request a token. And that token um, is basically the credential that allows us to access whatever it is we have um, permissions to access. I apologize. So, what, yep. Wait, one second. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This is something that you would be less likely to know. It's easy for us to do a demo like this, especially when we create the project, because when we create the project, or if you create the project, you will automatically have some degree of permissions. However, Keith, if you would just click on user rights over there on the left for a minute on that menu under applications. Yeah, just click on that a minute. And then click on your your permission, your username there and edit that. Yeah. So and scroll down just a little bit. Stop, stop, stop. So if you're going to give permissions to somebody else in your project, you will have to give them the API permission before you can generate the token, which is what he's going to show you. But I just want to make sure that we don't leave out a step for those people that, you know, if you try to generate a token and you get a message back that says you don't have permissions or whatever. And I don't know if you were going to touch on that, but uh, because I'm not sure whether you'll get a message back or not. But I know that if they aren't added to your project and they don't have these permissions, they're not going to get any of it. Anyway, yep. go ahead. Thank you. Oh, thank, thanks, Terry. Actually, I, I had forgotten to mention that, so I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, so we'll go back over to the API again. Um, and if I come in here, it'll tell you what it's going to do here, which is basically each project needs its own token, um, and I'll generate the token. It gives you this big, long string, um, which you can then copy um, if you want to use that in some other application or in your code. But there's an easier way to do it, um, and we'll look at that. But I do want to mention how important it is to keep this confidential. This is all somebody needs to access whatever that token has permissions to do. And if that's delete records, if that's in putting new records in, if it's removing records, retrieving all your data, including sensitive data, that API token is all you need to do that. So it is something you want to protect very carefully. Um, when you're done using them, I always come in and delete the token. That way I don't have to worry about it hanging out there and somebody getting a hold of it. You can also regenerate the token. So if it's been a while, you're using these, this over a long period of time, I come in and regenerate my tokens periodically. It's just like changing your password, um, just to be extra sure that nobody's getting a hold of that and misusing it. Um, and, and, re and remember, again, if you're managing a project or whatever, and if you're just a regular user, I have a feeling that um, Keith can generate an API token because he's a, an administrator for RedCap. But if it's a, a standard user, uh, you would you may have to give yourself those API permissions that we were looking at at user rights and certainly someone that you want to generate. And as you saw, the API token is yours. So only you are going to see it. So when a user wants to generate an API token, once they have permission, if they come to this screen and they don't have permission, they're not going to be able to generate this token. So stay conscious of API token permissions are a right that you find in user rights. Okay, thanks. Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. No, please do. Please do jump in. Um, Again, this is one of those things. Keith is such a an consummate programmer and teacher but doesn't uh, build so many projects. And so it's only from experience with myself that with user rights and generating tokens and running into those errors, even as an administrator, I will run into issues generating an API token on a project if I'm not added to the project. So I say that to the rest of the members of our team that have not used tokens before. If you come to a project where somebody you're start you're going to try and help them generate an API token or work with an API, you're going to have to be in the, have user rights that grant you the permissions for APIs 
before you'll be able to generate a token, even though you are a Red Cap administrator. So there you go. Yeah, and those are all excellent points. And Terry's right. Um, my role typically starts where we're about to go more so than it does with the permission side of things. So um, exactly, exactly. So yeah, I appreciate you jumping in like that, Terry. Um, so now, if once we have our token, we have this what we need to access it. We know Redcap has our data, and I'm going to assume for right now that our primary goal is to retrieve some data from Redcap into something else. So, for example, R, maybe you want to do some statistical analysis or plotting or build a shiny dashboard or something like that. Um, and the way you start off with that is you go into the API playground, which is right next to the API um, link. And we click on that. Um, this is where it does some amazing things. Um, it makes this all so much easier than if this didn't exist. Um, and what we do is we start off by telling it, what is it we want to do? And it has these API methods um, where it can do all sorts of things for us. Um, and a couple that I'll look at real quickly is if we come down to projects, um, oops, I went too far. We can export project information. We can export records. Um, pretty much anything that's in your in your um, project, you can export one way or the other. We're not limited to exporting. We can delete, we can import, we can do a lot of other things as well. Um, but let's just start off by looking at exporting. And as I change these options, right now we've got um, export project information. You'll notice down here what it does is these are the parameters. Those are those things that go after that web address that I showed in the PowerPoint. Um, it's got the token, what is it we want, project information, what format do we want it in. We can change the formats here. Um, I recommend if you're using either Python or R to stick with JSON, it works very well. Um, if you're using something like Excel, you might want CSV, or if you're using a tool that only supports XML, or if that's your preference, that's available as well. But I tend to stick with JSON most often, um, which is just a structured way of passing data if you haven't used it. Um, then when we scroll down further, we'll see here we have tabs with multiple languages on it. Most people that I've worked with are either want to do it in R or Python, but you'll see we do have other options here. And what this is going to do is take this information from the top, and it's actually going to generate the code we need to issue that type of request. So we've asked for the project information. If I come down and I say, okay, I want that in R, you'll see it's written some R code for us. It's taken the token information. It's building all this up. It then builds our request um, where it's going to string together the URL, this red cap API portion, um, all of this information about the token and so on. It's got the token up here and it'll generate this code for us. The code will, after it formats all that, post, which means send, send the request to um, red cap. Um, with that information, it gets the results back in this response. Um, the, the textual version of that, or, or in this case, um, the JSON version will go into result and then we'll print it. So what's kind of cool about this is it just, we told it what we wanted, it wrote all the code for us. And if I come up and hit execute request, you'll see what it did is project ID. There's my project ID number, the title, the title of it and so on and all the information about my project. It just ran that in R. We can now take this code and copy it into our R project and it'll run right, right away. Um, it's, it's already done. Um, and for the project information, that's just one small thing you might want. But what if we wanted to export the data, for example? Um, we can come down to records, export records. And again, I only have one record in here, but we can filter it by, we can say which fields we want. I'll say I want all of them. Um, we can, um, th there's all kinds of options in here. You can do filtering based on dates and anything you could possibly want. Um, and then when we come down, we'll see it's, again, has built the, all these parameters for us, which if RedCap didn't do this for us, we would end up having to type all of this in, telling it what all the fields we want and so on. But it's made our life easy. It's done all that for us. So now we come down here, we've got our code already written. We execute that. And you'll see it's now returned my name and some other made up data that I stuck in there. Um, and that's all there is to retrieving data. Um, it's, it's extremely simple. Um, if we then decide that we don't want to do it in R now, we want to do it in Python, we can come over here. It's now rewritten it all for us in Python. Um, we can run it in Python here the same way, and we get the same results back. So really cool, really simple. If we then take this code, um, let me go back to the R version first. 
and we copy this out just to show you we're not limited to using it here. We can then go out of here and go into our studio. And before I run this, um, I want to show you something. I mentioned those error codes earlier. I ran this earlier, just making sure everything was going to work today for us. And um, you'll notice down here, I got a 503 service unavailable, which meant for whatever reason, I wasn't able to connect to the server. In this case, it was an error I made, but I just wanted to show you that that's an example where you can run into these error codes and it helps to kind of know what you're expecting and what you're not when things go wrong. Um, I do have to repost this in there because I've changed the token now. So I'm gonna get rid of my old version, paste the new one in there. And if we run that, we'll see, here's our date. Here's our data where it started coming back, the record ID, my name, and so on. So I'm no longer in REDCap here. This is in our studio. I could then take this record, which has come back in this result field. It's all this JSON. Um, there's libraries or packages in R as well as in Python that let you process that data. It cleans it up for you, makes it easy to use. If you've used these tools before, you can do things like load it into a data frame very easily. Um, and use any of the tools you might be used to using in any of these languages at that point. So at this point, our data is all pulled out. We can start working with it any way we want in our language. And we didn't really have to write any code um, just to get to this basic level. What I often do is I end up having to do multiples of these calls. I might want to get the data dictionary. I might want to get the project information and then also get a subset or all of the records to work with. Um, so you'll end up taking several of these stubs, pasting them all into your project up here, making multiple calls, and then combining the data however you'd like to. Um, while we're looking at that, let's go ahead and get out of this and go back over to this one. So this is our Python code. I do have to go back over and copy my code out. Let's see, I got too many windows going. Um, I don't think that one's going to run that way. We just fixed the token. That's the only thing that changed. So now I'm in Microsoft Visual Studio Code. This is Python instead of R. Just based, I update my security information. And if I come up and I run this, hopefully, if all goes well, you can see the data came back down here as well. So again, it's now contained in the variable R. Just by coincidence, that's the way REDCap did it. It's not the language R, it's just the, the variable in Python. But at that point, we can start manipulating it any way we want um, with the data we've retrieved from it.